Hello, welcome to Encore. Coming up, God Loves Haiti. Set in the aftermath of the 2010 earthquake, Dimitri Elias Leger's debut novel pays tribute to the resilient people of Haiti through three characters, its president, his wife, and her lover. We'll also be at Paris's Grand Palais, which is celebrating 200 years of Haitian art. Dimitri, welcome to the show. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Now, often when people think of Haiti, it's sort of as a place marked by suffering. It's referred to as the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, one of the poorest on Earth. These labels seem to be attached to Haiti as a sort of ball and chain. Um, do you think it's fair? It is a very poor place. Um, and it has been unlucky. Um, but who hasn't been unlucky? Um, countries are a bit like families. Um, they have their highs and their lows. They have their rich and their poor. And, um, but we love them all the same. And Haitians love Haiti. They're proud of Haiti. Um, the country has an illustrious history. Um, but it has a special share of bad luck. And you left Haiti when you were born there, but you left when you were 14 to go and live in the United States. You live in France now, though. What are your memories like of growing up there? Haiti was fantastic. Um, I lived there from the ages 8 to 14. Being a child in the Caribbean, being a child on a Caribbean island, it was peaceful, it was safe, relatively safe at the time, and you had the freedom to do um, whatever you want. There was the beach right there at all, at all times. There was 35 degree weather at all times. Some of the best years of my life. And so you're well qualified to kind of sift through the um, real and psychological rubble of the 2010 earthquake. Um, because you grew up there, but also because you worked um, with the UN in the aftermath. Um, how much of your experience is in your book, God Loves Hate? Very little, um, very little. Um, the book really, the characters in the book are people who experienced the earthquake and they're dealing with post-traumatic stress syndrome. I came in two weeks later, I didn't experience the earthquake, but I heard their stories and I felt their pain. And I thought the story would be a good way to explore how people deal with grief, how you deal with bad luck, and how to get back on your feet. And the story takes place only within a month, the day of the earthquake and about four weeks afterwards. And it's about three people trying to get back on their feet and trying to redeem themselves or make sense of the good luck of surviving the earthquake. And there's an exhibition on in Paris at the moment that um, celebrates 200 years of Haitian art. It's at the Grand Palais. It wraps up at the end of this week. Have you seen it? I have seen it. I spent a wonderful morning there yesterday. And it focuses sort of on Haitian art from the 19th century to the present day. I mean, is there a thread? Did you, did you notice one? I did like what it did in terms of contrasting contemporary artists and some classic Haitian artists. Um, so when you see uh, a Telemac next to a Basquiat, um, Telemac came after Basquiat, and you see them next to each other, and it's, it's terrific. Um, and there were portraits of Haitians, um, Haitian deputies who are governors of the island from the 17th, 18th century, and you saw that, and one of them, one of the coolest men I've ever seen in my life. Um, and that was pretty cool. Um, you don't get that picture, in particular, hangs in Versailles, and to see it there next to other portraits and other pictures and other art that's from contemporary artists, it was a good mix. And one of the artists um, that features in the exhibition is Mario Benjamin. He makes an interesting point. Have a listen. It's becoming a form of harassment if you're from Haiti, but you don't talk about the earthquake or, you know, the sun or cholera. It means we're not really Asian. Moving away is usually regarded as positive in the life of an artist, and it's always been like that. Picasso, for example, he lived in France for a long time because he wanted to. I don't think anyone asked Picasso to account for Spain. So I wanted to get your reaction to what he said. How much of being Haitian is part of what you do? It is 110%. Um, being a lifelong immigrant, um, I've seen every form of debate. I've experienced every form of anxiety. But the country always worked for me. I love the place. And I'd long wanted to tell Haitian stories in novel form. And it took me a long time to figure it out or to find the right voice and to do it and do it well. I've had a lot of bad efforts and false starts. As an artist, I felt like 
telling stories um, about Haitians would be my contribution to global society and to Haitian society. America has enough writers to tell its stories. And France, where I've been living for 10 wonderful years, has enough writers to tell its stories. Why not tell Haitian stories? The characters you um, tell the stories through are the president of Haiti, his wife, and her lover. Tell me about this, I mean, I don't want to call it a love triangle, but it, it is a love triangle. Tell me um, about these characters and why you pick them. Um, they came to me. Um, they came to me. I've, I've some of my favorite novels. Um, in preparing to write about the earthquake and write about recovering from the earthquake, I turned to a lot of World War II novels. Um, some of my favorite ones, The English Patient by Michael Ndaje, um, Graham Greene's The End of the Affair. Um, they told World War II stories, love stories, through the prism of adultery. Adultery is one of those great, great, um, great vehicles for looking at the human heart and looking at how we love each other and, and our divided souls and how to make peace with each other. And war is an extreme setting for that. So it's a collusion of two great forces, countries ripping themselves, tearing themselves apart, and people dividing themselves amongst different pieces and dealing with all those anxieties at the same time. And one of the themes of the book um, that struck me is this notion that there's no such thing as a free lunch, or in this case, a free rescue. As you're going through the book, um, when the rescuers arrive, the Haitians wonder what part of their um, nation the rescuers are going to take um, or claim. Foreign aid workers are talked about in a condescending way in the book. And um, the leader of the foreign relief effort is described as a dark-eyed London cop turned blue-helmeted United Nations neo-colonialist masquerading as a peacekeeper. I mean, is there a general mistrust of outsiders then in Haiti? When you're as vulnerable as, you, as Haitians were after the earthquake, you can't get more vulnerable than that. When 70% of the capital of your country is destroyed, um, you, don't, you can't know what up is, you don't know what down is. Um, any outsider who comes in, you feel exposed. You freak out. And that's the sense I described. So if the rescuers had been anybody other than Haitians, it would have felt weird. Um, it's just a natural reaction. Because um, when you're vulnerable, you want your family closer. And you want your loved ones close. And foreigners, strangers, by definition, are not family. Even if they come to help. But again, this we're all doing while Haitians are dealing with the shock. In the immediate aftermath of the shock, yes, everything is weird. Everything seems foreign. But as weeks went on, people totally appreciated the presence of aid workers. And the aid workers did do amazing work. But Haiti has a long tradition, like many countries, of being skeptical of outsiders. And because aid workers are very prominent in Haiti for the last 25 years, um, they have a mixed reputation. Most countries, most people would rather have trade than aid. And unfortunately, Haiti has gotten more aid than trade in the last quarter century. And that's reflected in the mixed feelings. And while um, you deal with grief, it's also the romantic comedy, as we talked about. Um, and we also learn about Haiti's history. I mean, if for people at home who maybe don't know very much about Haiti, if there was one thing um, you wanted them to know about the nation, what would it be? Wow. Um, it's a beautiful place. <laughs> um, the, the, the Dominican Republic is very popular as a tourist destination. Um, we share the same island, so we have the same warm um, Atlantic Ocean, and we have the same white sandy beaches, and the food is fantastic, and... Uh, Dancing and the nightlife is epic. Um, if I was want somebody to know one thing about Haiti is that it's as beautiful as any country in the Caribbean and more interesting and more fun to visit and to experience than you would think. And what about the future? Paint me a picture for Haiti. Wow, that's um, bigger than me. Um, but I'd say at, there's 9 million Haitians. There were 6 million when I was a kid there. Um, and the country's gotten, has had hard times since, since I was a kid there. Yet, there are three million more Haitians. So as long as there are Haitians, um, Haiti's going to be a good time. It's going to have its highs and its lows. It's going to have its bad days. 
but the good days are pretty sweet. Okay, Dimitri, thank you so much for coming in and speaking to us. Thanks for having me. France 24. And a reminder for you guys at home, Dimitri's book is called God Loves Haiti. And we're going to leave you with images from the retrospective of 200 years of Haitian art at the Grand Palais in Paris, which finishes on the 15th of February. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Thank you.